Can we lift our hands toward heaven one more time and just give God the honor? Make it personal. Sometimes we get lost in the congregation and we don't really engage God. The Bible said they go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion that appeared before the Lord. You have made an appearance. It's time to move in the spirit. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them that appeared before the Lord. He said, ask of him rain in the time of the latter rain. He will cause bright cloud upon every blade of grass. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, the Bible said they heard a sound as of a rushing mighty wind. And he said, flaming tongues as of fire fell upon them and it was on the head of everyone. You cannot be lost in the congregation. Can you lift your hands now and talk to the Lord? Ask him to encounter you personally tonight. Thank God for what he's doing in the house, but you must have your own personal encounter tonight. Can you cry? Is this how you pray? I need desperate people, passionate people, deliberate people tonight. Call upon the name of the Lord. Ask him for an encounter. The psalmist said, as the deer tested, panted after the waters, he said, so my soul longeth after thee. In a dry and testy land where no water is. Go ahead and cry. spirit thank you lord for unveiling your oracles to us as a people under your government lord even tonight we ask that you stretch forth your hand and do that which only you can do grant encounters to your children and father we ask that anyone that is here with a burden that burden is alighted already lord do this and take the glory in jesus precious name you may be seated 
Glory to Jesus. Since it's the first night, it's important that I do a bit of exegesis. Hallelujah. Praise God. Faith for exploit. Tonight, I just want to advance a few points that makes your faith come alive. And not just come alive, but to be able to engender exploit in every sphere and in every aspect of your life. The Bible said in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, it said, according as his divine power, he has given us all things that pertains to life and godliness. He has given us all things that pertains to life and to godliness. He said, but it's through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue. And so every Christian suffering any form of lack today, that lack is not his problem. The lack is actually an alarm system of ignorance. Because the moment knowledge comes, everything that pertains to life and godliness is furnished. And so sometimes we are praying to God and presenting problems to him, and God is telling us that is not our problem. Our problem is the ignorance locking in our hearts. The moment knowledge comes, crises vanish. And so it's important for us to come into an experiential knowledge of God so that our faith can come alive and then we begin to make impact. You know the significance of faith. It cannot be undermined. The Bible summarized the work of the believer, the totality of the work of the believer as a work of faith. He said, and the just shall live by faith. The justified shall live by faith. The summary of the work of the believer is called faith. That is to let you know how indispensable faith is in the equation of existence. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4, the just shall live by faith. And we don't just live by faith. We go from faith to faith because the level of impact your life commands is the degree of faith that you can exercise. And so this conference is very vital in that it is designed to upgrade the quality of your existence. It's not only designed to meet you at the point of your need. It's not only designed to deal with the challenges of your life. It is actually designed to upgrade the quality of your existence. This is why you must open up your spirit to receive everything the Lord will be communicating and advancing from this altar in the course of this conference. Because I know all the speakers are charged up by the Holy Spirit to come give your life a meaning. Hallelujah. Before I go into my points tonight, I just want to itemize three things that actually defines the essence of our existence. If our existence will count, these three things are a must. And trust me, if you read your Bible, you will discover everything God is doing with man is designed for him to achieve these three things. And the third part of it is what pertains to our conference. But let me advance it very quickly as we go into the word of the Lord tonight. The first thing that gives meaning and definition to your existence is the knowledge of God. If you don't know God, your existence will count for nothing. What improves the quality of your life and what gives meaning to you in the realm of God is the measure of the knowledge of God that you have. In fact, Jesus was speaking in John chapter 17 verse 3 and he said, this is life eternal, not oxygen, not breath, not resources. He said that you may know him, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. John 17 verse 3. That means life has no meaning except as you come into an experiential knowledge of God. And I tell you, there are many people walking today, all they have is breath on their nostrils, some money in their bank accounts, and a few resources here and there. That is beautiful, but what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and suffers the loss of his soul? And they say, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So the first thing that brings true meaning and fulfillment to existence is the knowledge of God that you possess. If you do not have the knowledge of God, your existence is a waste. And it is in knowing God that your life can give pleasure to him. In Revelation chapter 4 verse 11, 
the elders were speaking, the 20 and 4 elders, and they said, all things were created for thy glory. So we are not here for ourselves. God is the only being that exists for himself. God is the only being whose meaning of existence is himself. Every other created being exists for God. And this is why you must know God so that your life can fuse into his agenda and then you will find meaning. And so the first thing that gives essence to your existence and improves the quality of your life is the degree of the knowledge of God. Number two, the second thing that gives meaning to your life is your growth in God. Because God created us to experience him. God created us to grow in him and to partake of his essence. You know, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4 says that he has given us exceeding great and precious promises that we might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So God wants us to partake and participate in the divine to have a measure of the experience of the divine. And so as you begin to know God, you will discover that you start growing in God. And a point comes where when people see you, they will no longer know you after the flesh. They will know you after the dimension of God that you have metamorphosed into. And so when you meet a man who is not transforming into the image of God, that man's existence has no relevance where it matters. When Jesus showed up, in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 to 3, he said, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. He said, but has in this last day spoken to us by his son. What is the difference between his son and the prophets? The prophets only had the oracles of God, but beyond the word of God, the son, the Bible said, he is the express image of his person. The son mirrored the father. The son expressed the father. And so the heartbeat of God is for you to come to a point where when men see you, they see your God. So when they are looking for God, they don't look in the skies. They look at the sons. And so when we gather like this, we become a collocation of different dimensions of God. This is why the church is called the body of Christ. That means somebody here is the hand of God. Somebody here is the mind of Christ. Somebody here is the mouth of God. So when we gather like this, you are not seeing a congregation of members. You are seeing different parts of God. This is the essence of existence. You grow into him in all things. And when Paul was teaching in Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 11, he told us the reason God gave the fivefold ministry is to mature the saints to become like Christ. He said he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping, the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry and for the edifying, the growing of the body of Christ. And he showed us seven levels of growth. He said, number one, go to the next verse, verse 13. He said that we may come into the unity of the faith. So when a man begins to grow in God, the first indicator is unity. So you don't see the person sitting next to you as a church member. You see the person sitting next to you as your brother and sister. And you even go further, not just to see him as your brother and sister, you see him as a part of your body because both of you have become one. But you see, if we prophesy, if we sing, if we receive miracles and we gossip ourselves, we scandalize ourselves, we hate ourselves, we compete with ourselves, it means all of the things we are receiving really did not profit us because we are not growing into God. We come into the unity of the faith. Number two, he said, to the knowledge of the Son of God. Are you seeing knowledge again? So everybody will know his God. Did you read your Bible? You see a whole generation. God is talking about one man. There, there were thousands of people that lived on earth. But it's the one that knows him that is significant. When you read Genesis chapter 1 to chapter 12, you see God speaking about creation. And then all of a sudden, God migrates and begins to talk about his work with one man. And he talks about Abraham from Genesis 12 to Genesis 24. The question is, was Abraham the only man on earth? As far as God was concerned, this is the one that has a walk with me. And he's more important to me than the whole generation. So Abraham can call God El Shaddai. 
this is my revelation of him this is who he is to me he is my supplier that is what it means to have the knowledge of the son of god so you will come to a point where you say i know jesus is the second person of the godhead but jesus is my source jesus is my strength jesus is my provider jesus is my defender you have known him and you have personalized him but you see if all we know about god is what somebody told us we are not growing john was speaking in first john chapter one from verse one to two he said that which was from the beginning which we have heard once upon a time a pastor preached him to us he said but now we have seen and handled of the word of life he said it is on the strength of our handling him that we can bring you into fellowship and so if a believer is maturing in god he will come to a point where there is something about god that he has handled so he becomes the representation of that thing paul said if the church is not growing like that then the five-fold ministry is failing our job is not just to give you breakthroughs by the anointing so when we are talking exploit, you need to understand these things in context. The first real exploit God can do for you is that you are transforming to become like Christ. We all with open faces beholding as in the glass. The image of the Lord, we are changed. So a point comes where you represent something in God. You become a stakeholder in the spirit. The knowledge of the Son of God. Number three, he said, unto a perfect man. And what does he mean by a perfect man? It's not a sinless man. There's a level you grow to in God where you really overcome sin. But what he's talking about here is the ability to control your impulses, to rule over your flesh. Because James chapter 3 verse 2 said, a man that has authority over his tongue, control over his tongue, he said that man is a perfect man. So when a believer is maturing in God, what happens and what you discover is that he doesn't respond by emotions, he responds by leadings. And so somebody may insult you, it is the move of the spirit on your inside that will determine your response, not the anger that emanates from your mind. So Paul said, as we are maturing in God, we come to that point where we are no longer fluctuating by emotions. We are stable because it's the word and the spirit that leads us. The principles of the word is what becomes our navigation. And then you don't stop there. You go to the next verse. He say you now grow into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. What is the measure of the stature of Christ? It is the boundary of the word of God. Because Christ is the word made flesh. So you come to a point where your philosophy in life crystallizes from the scripture. This is why sometimes when people are going through lack, they become self-centered. You have a need for money. You are liberal. It doesn't make sense by human standard. But you have checked something from the world. The word said the libra soul shall be made fat. Him that watereth shall by himself be watered not to. So why the principle of the word said get all you can and can what you all you get. The word of the Lord says become libra. In the morning sow thy seed. In the evening withhold not thy hand. For you know not the evil that comes upon the earth. So when the world is going left you are going right. And they are looking at you and wondering why are you operating like this. I am functioning in the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. It's what the word of God says that I do. Not what is popular and not what appears to work. And they cannot understand why your life is like this. And truly they shouldn't because you have become like Christ. At that point you can say henceforth know we no man after the flesh. I bear in my body the marks of Christ. I'm telling you the foundations of exploit. That when a man becomes like God, exploit becomes a byproduct. And then you don't just live by the word. Paul said you now go to a point where you are no longer tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. So now you understand truth. You don't just understand verses of scripture. You understand truth. See, there are people who quote verses of scripture but they don't know truth. There are two different things. When you look at light, light is white light have seven colors you can look at green and argue all your life that light is green in a unique context you are correct but in a holistic perspective you are wrong because light is not only green light is red indigo orange green blue yellow is a is a spectrum of seven different colors so when a man is quoting scripture and he doesn't know truth you have a problem because there are certain contexts he will be correct there are certain other contexts he will be wrong let me give you an instance for example. 
If you look at Exodus 23, 25, the Bible says, you shall serve the Lord your God. He shall bless thy bread and thy waters, and he shall remove sickness from the midst of thee. You now come to Isaiah 53, verse 5. He said, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. You now come to Romans chapter 8, verse 11. He said, if that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he will quicken your mortal body. Hope you know you can quote this individual scripture and be healed. But you may quote those individual scripture and not grow. Because currently where we are, we are not serving the Lord our God to be healed. The Holy Ghost dwells on our inside. You know the difference? If you are operating in Exodus 23, 24, you don't know Jesus Christ. But if you are operating in Romans 8, 11, you don't just know Jesus, now you have the Holy Spirit. So you are not operating with God based on your own merit. You are operating with God based on the merit of Christ and you are living in the fullness of the move of the Holy Spirit. So one is correct if he quotes those scripture but when it has to do with truth you may not be very correct if you stay with individual scripture are you following this so we need to grow in doctrine so that we know truth not just in isolated context but in holistic context paul said no more tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and then he went to the sixth level of growth he said now speaking the truth in love so every action you take is love motivated every action you take is the nature of God motivated you see that you are growing from one level to another from one level to another and finally Paul now said we now grow into him in all things even Christ the head of the church so what God is looking out for in your life is that a day will come when if he looks at you he will look at Jesus so there is a time when God forgave your sins because of Jesus. But now you are living above sin. There was a time when God accepted what you do because of Jesus. But now your life has transformed until you have become exactly like Jesus. So when God sees you, he sees Christ in you. This is where the apostles grew to. And you hear them say, be a followers of me as I'm the follower of Christ. So if you meet me, even if I've not spoken about Jesus, it will be as though you have met Jesus Christ. This is where the apostles got to and they say, as he is, so are we, not in heaven, in this world. Because what God is looking out for is that every one of us should mirror him. Every one of us should look like him so that our appearance alone becomes a message to our generation. But look at the problem we have. We are preaching powerful messages, but we don't look like the messages we are preaching. So a man is talking about holiness, but he's a con sinner. And so the message does not have witness enough to bring the glory of God. And so a generation is confused. How come the same people who talk so much about God are the ones who are always caught in every wrong doings in society? You now discover that we know the message that is accepted but our life does not conform. And that is not the testimony of God. The testimony of God is that we become so that we can preach. He said concerning Jesus of all that he both began to do and to teach. Acts chapter 1 from verse 1 to 2. If you don't become, your message may be correct. But at the end of time, God will tell you away from me, you walk out of iniquity. And so the second thing that gives meaning to your life is the degree to which you have transformed into the God kind. How much of God does your life mirror? These are the things that should be a burden in our hearts. Does that anger still have the best of you? Does that lying still have the best of you? Does that immorality still have the best of you? Does that malice, that bitterness, does it still have the best of you? If that thing still rules over you, it means you are not achieving much in God. Because what God is looking for is for you to reflect Jesus. The same way Jesus reflected the Father. Philip told him, show us the Father and we will see him. He said, whoever have seen me, have seen the father you know what our testimony should be when a word asks us where is jesus so us jesus you say whoever have seen me have seen jesus be a followers of me as i'm the follower of christ as he is so are we in this world if your life gets to that level then your life has meaning that is the second essence of existence and then the third essence of existence is impact because god has an agenda and anybody who is not fulfilling that agenda, his stay here is a waste. Jesus was speaking in John chapter 20 verse 21. He said, as the Father have sent me, 
he says so also send I you so it is the work I was doing for the father that you will continue this is why you didn't go to heaven the day you gave your heart to Christ because the assignment Jesus came to carry out you are the agent who is advancing that assignment now in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 he said not many days from now you shall receive the Holy Ghost and power and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and in the uttermost part of the world. I want you to represent the same assignment that I was representing. Paul was speaking in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. He said, Now are we the ambassadors of Christ? So we are here representing heavenly agenda. Listen, your job is not your assignment. Your job is a platform to fulfill your assignment. But you see, many people are not conscious of divine agenda. And so when they are working in a bank, they think their life begins and ends with the bank. And the bank becomes everything that defines them. When they are working as lawyers, they think their life begins and ends in the law firm. See, the Muslim man doesn't think so. Because he understands something about kingdom that we have not yet understood. When you are in the bank, the bank is a platform for advancing the kingdom of God. When you are in the legal system, it's a platform for advancing the kingdom of God. God has an agenda. What is his agenda? That the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. So that the will of God will find expression. And so if you are a lecturer and the people there are not obeying the will of God, your stay there is no relevance. If you are in the bank and the people there are not submitted to the government of God, your stay there has no relevance. So when we are talking about exploit, it's not God give me a car. When we are talking about exploit, it's not God heal me. If we are talking about exploit, it's not God give me money. If we are talking about exploit, we are saying, Lord, empower me more so that anywhere I come to, your kingdom will come there. Why is healing then part of the equation? Because if you are sick, you can't advance kingdom. Why is money part of the equation? Because my kingdom through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad. If you don't have money, you can't advance the kingdom. Why does influence become part of the equation? If you have no influence, you cannot advance the kingdom. So the things that we call a blessing are actually a byproduct of the impact that we are making. He said, Philip went to Samaria. He preached Christ there and the city was full of joy. So everybody who is seated here, your expectation should be that I have been in the entrepreneurship space for more than 10 years. I have excelled. I have made some money. But I cannot count how many people are Christians today because of my presence. I cannot count how many people are calling Jesus Lord today because of my presence. As I leave this place, if it is more influence I need in order to get more people to submit to Jesus, I receive that influence. If it is more money I need in order to get more people to call Jesus Lord, I receive that money. If it is more wisdom in order for more people to call Jesus Lord, I receive that wisdom. It is in that context that God begins to empower you so that as you return you return as an influencer you return as an agent of the kingdom of God this is what influence is about is to make a mark that cannot be denied but that mark is not just a mark in itself it's a mark that brings people under the authority of Jesus Christ we are all gathered here today because of one man most of us gave our hearts to Christ because of him. Most of us are serving God today because of him. But he didn't begin and end with him. He also came because of somebody else. The question is who will come because of you? And if nobody comes because of you, what is your beauty for? What is your money for? What is your health for? If nobody is submitted to Jesus because of you, what is your talent for? If nobody submitted to Jesus because of you, what is your position for? And so a mindset shift must first of all happen before we start trusting God for empowerment for exploit. Before we begin to trust God so that we even know what impact is in the, in the first place. You know, we, we have a secular mentality. So when you are talking exploit, you are talking impact. Somebody is thinking, I have one company. In the next seven months, I'm going to have seven. That is beautiful. But what, how does that advance God's kingdom? 
Somebody is thinking, oh, I have a million naira. In the next five months, I'm going to have 30 million. That is good. But how does that advance God's kingdom? Oh, I've been in one office, one level for, for three years. I need to receive my promotion. I'm moving from a major general to a, a lieutenant general. That is good. But how does that advance the kingdom? Because if you move from a major general to a lieutenant general and it doesn't impact God's kingdom, the guy who is a captain is making more impact than you. So promotion in itself is not the impact. It's the degree to which you bring kingdom that is the impact. And many channels are responsible for this. For this conference, we are using faith as a channel for advancing God's kingdom. And the degree to which we advance God's kingdom is what we are calling exploit exploit or impact so everybody who is here everything you are receiving here there must be a mindset through which you receive it that the empowerment is meant for kingdom advancement the empowerment is meant for bringing people under the authority of jesus christ otherwise the excitement and the blessing is a waste this is the foundation upon which everything we receive must be built. The people of the world understand it. Most of the billionaires you see today, you find them sponsoring all kinds of nonsense because they know they are representing the spirits powering them. They know it. They know it. They create systems that cause men to walk in darkness perpetually. In fact, that's how they make their money. They make their money by taking people to hell. And so everything they do is designed to rope the souls of men in darkness. They know how the system works. Only a believer thinks it's just about his belly. But we are a people that are responsible under God. We are a people that are submitted to God's government and we have one agenda. That the kingdoms of this world must become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. If you have understood this and this has become your foundation, then let's look at the faith that produces exploit. I'm talking for the, I'm, I'm, I'm the first speaker, so I need to give orientation. So people don't just get excited and start receiving. If you are healed tonight, know that your health will be used for kingdom advancement. That's what I'm saying. If God blesses you with finances tonight, know that your money will be used for kingdom advancement. If God gives influence and visibility to your business tonight, know that your influence will be used for kingdom advancement. If that is not your mindset, you are not a candidate for kingdom advancement. I'm not saying God won't bless you. In his benevolence, he will. But I'm saying God will not work with you. And I'm telling you also that your existence counts for nothing. When we go to heaven, many will be shocked. You know what the Bible said concerning John? It said, until the time of John. When I read that scripture, I almost wept. How many people on earth? How can you call a whole era? The era of John. So if you go to the history of God, you will not see years, you will see men. You are the one calling 1944. There's nothing like 1944 in God's calendar. Eternity is a timeless zone. So when you go to eternity, different eras are represented by men. The days of Abraham, the days of Deborah, the days of John. And so some people who are on earth, if they want to find you in God, they have to go and open the chapter of John. That's where you appear. If John's, if, if John's chapter is not open, that means you will never appear. Because he is the one who made the greatest impact and the whole era is wielded to him. Is that not bigger than a car? Then they now come and say, the days of a Mosfengwa. And then everybody who is born within that period, who did kingdom, if their records will be read, then they have to go and look for the book and the chapter called the Mosfengwa. I will not be lost in eternity. Me, I will not be lost. I will, nobody will go and put me in another person's chapter. I will have my own. The things we are pursuing when we leave this body, they mean nothing. But there are things that will travel with us to eternity. It's the impact we make for God. If this should take sleep for your eye, from your eye, let it do so. Look at the way we function on earth. 
one person is coming, a whole city is happy. Oh, this apostle is coming. Oh, this music minister is coming. Oh, this doctor is coming. Oh, this leader is coming. And then you see that one person stand in the spotlight and millions of other people are shouting and fainting. Move from the crowd. Come out from the crowd. Come out. Come out. All of us can shine. All of us. Because all of us can make impact in our own world. Don't leave this conference until you are empowered sufficient to make impact in your own world. Do you know the people that should clap for us? They are the world. Jesus said when we step out, the trees of the field will clap. It's the world that should clap for us. We should encourage ourselves because every one of us will be making impact for God. And you will not leave this conference until your life becomes consequential. You mighty on your throne. You reign. You ancient Zion skin. Kadosh, Kadosh. You are mighty on your throne. Do we have a timer? Okay. I need to be sure where I am. So I've laid the foundation. Now let's look at um, the faith that provokes exploits. There are five dimensions that must be added to your faith in order for your faith to produce exploit. Number one is knowledge. Any faith that is not built on knowledge cannot produce exploit. Number two, dimension of faith that produces exploit is faith that is built on love. Any faith that has no love underneath it cannot produce exploit. Number three, dimension of faith that produces exploit is faith built on prayer. Any faith that has no prayer coded into it cannot produce exploit. Number four, dimension of faith that produces exploit is faith derived from obedience if your faith does not come from obedience to the leading of the holy spirit it will have no exploit and then number five dimension of faith that produces real exploit is faith built into good conscience if you want your faith to produce exploit these five things must be ingrained in your faith number one knowledge number two love number three prayer number four obedience and number five good conscience listen one thing you should hate is impression refuse to create impression we are in a world today where people want to create impression to be seen in a certain way but they know they are not there this is the difference between our generation and the generation of the fathers and that is why till today when we preach and we want things to happen we start quoting them who were they quoting? Because we don't have the power that produces tangible results. This is why today we speak and exaggerate and make things appear lofty. Because the rugged, pure apostolic faith is no more. In the days of the fathers, they were there to confound those who argued against God. They were not there using the tools of the world to advance kingdom. A man could show up in a city and tell you God is a healer. If you say it's a lie, bring the sick. There's no talk, it's not grammar. I say my God is a healer. If you say God does not exist, I'm telling you God exists and he's a healer. If you argue, bring the sick. And they brought sick people with doctors and journalists watching to see what will happen. And they healed those sick people, they confirmed it and realized they were healed and there was no argument. Because power is the end of argument. But our generation is a generation of stories and manipulation. There is so much theatrics on the altar. And this is why we are creating impression instead of impact. In this conference, one thing I'm trusting God, not just to do for somebody, but to make somebody become an agent of, is to create verifiable, undeniable proofs that God is real. That is the faith that produces impact. But for you to walk in that dimension of faith, there must be knowledge. This faith must be built in conviction. Listen, if you don't know God and know him well, you will never manifest exploit. In Daniel eleven thirty two, the Bible said, they that do know they are God, not everybody, 
That means God is the God of everybody. But those who we do exploit is those among the people that are God's people who know they are God. So if you want to make impact, your problem is not faith. The faith is already there. In Romans 12, 3, the Bible said, He dealt unto every one of us the measure of faith. Can I tell you something? You have enough faith to raise the dead. You have enough faith to set a generation on fire. He said, the measure. That means the faith that was given to you is enough for your destiny. He dealt unto everyone the measure of faith. Our problem has never been a faith problem. In fact, the faith you have now is the same faith that Jesus walked with. You know how the Bible puts it? Galatians 2.20. Here's what Paul said. He said, I have the faith of the Son of God. And the faith that Paul had, that he called the faith of the Son of God, is the same faith that the apostles had. Because Paul was speaking in 2 Corinthians 4.13. He said, we have been the same spirit of faith. And then the faith that the apostles had, Peter wrote in 2 Peter 1 verse 1. He said, every one of you have like precious faith. So the faith I have, the faith you have, the faith she has, is the same faith that Jesus had. Is the same faith that the apostles had. The problem and the difference in our manifestation is the depth of our understanding. I know God more than you, I will use my faith more than you. You know God more than me, you will use your faith more than me. So your problem is not a faith problem. Your problem is a knowledge problem. They that do know they are God, they will be strong and they will do exploit. Listen to me, why do you think people appear and make the crisis of other people like a casual issue it's not because the problem reduced in size it's because there is a superior understanding that undermines the mystery of that problem and so every one of us here can make challenges become platforms of manifestation the problem is that our understanding is shallow most of us understand like children and the devil knows this this is why one of the devil's greatest attack is in the area of knowledge acquisition as you are seated here, you can watch a movie for 10 hours. Carry your Bible and see where sleep will come out from. He knows if you look into that Bible, something will happen to your faith. The faith has been planted in you when you receive Christ, but it will take knowledge to make it work. You know what Ephesians 3.20 said? He said God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you ask or think but it's according to something the power at work on your inside that means if the power is you in you is not working god will not be able to do so there is faith on your inside but that faith needs knowledge to be activated when you read your bible everybody that shifted ground knew something about god did you read the story of the woman with the issue of blood the bible said she heard all that jesus did so there was a knowledge she possessed she heard, she heard, she heard. This man talks to the deaf, the ears open. Really? This man talks to the blind, the eyes see. Really? This man talks to the dead, the dead come back to life. Really? She didn't bother about those things. She kept looking for doctors, spending money. When she heard enough, something woke up on her inside. It was not premeditated because that faith can give you an understanding. And she said to herself, if this man is what they say he is i don't even need him to talk to me a man who talks to the dead a man who talks to the dead if i can only but touch the hem of his garment i will be made whole how did she know that so this woman that was looking for doctors had something in her to cure her affliction but it took knowledge knowledge needed to graduate to a level before power can be released and Jesus was not aware of her. See, this is the excellency of faith. Jesus does not need to know that you are here. Faith can get his attention. Jesus didn't know she was there. Jesus heard. He turned and said, virtue has left me. Who touched me? And Peter looked at him. What do you mean who touched you? Everybody is touching you. Everybody is thronging you. This one didn't touch me with her hand. She touched me with her faith. So this woman had enough faith to touch Jesus when Peter couldn't touch him yes but he took knowledge he took knowledge she stopped Jesus' move see see, a man of faith can stop the move of God to attend to him because every time Jesus is moving that's the move of God so you can channel the whole resources of a revival to your house and the revival 
can tell a nation wait let me attend to this one first because faith is what determines the direction of power who touched me is the woman that heard the question is what do you know if you know something something will rise on your inside did you not read about Bartimaeus? the bible said he was begging at the gate of the city of jericho and suddenly they told him jesus was coming he said wait which one is he the son of david they said yes is he the one that raised the dead they say yes is this the one that opened blind eyes they say yes they need people like me he responds to faith thou son of david have mercy on me and jesus stopped sir people stop jesus people of faith and the whole move of god stopped and jesus attended to one man before a city because his faith made him more relevant than a city jesus stopped it didn't matter if he was in a hurry it didn't matter if he had an agenda the faith could, could, could not let him take a step and jesus stopped and walked up to him bring him here what do you want others are telling god what they want god is asking others what do you want and the man said that i might see again see when you know god you become unstoppable this is why you must doctor your faith with knowledge see read the bible listen to messages anything that brings faith make it your friend you don't raise faith mechanically you build faith spiritually he said now faith cometh by hearing by hearing so your ear is the answer to your crisis what you do with your ear is the answer to your crisis the reason you are still in that sickness is because you are using your ears wrongly the reason you are still in that depth is because you are using your ears wrongly the reason you are still in that crisis is because you are using your ear wrongly see god this instrument oh, your life depends on how you use it faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of god what have you heard you have heard fear you have heard bad government you have heard systemic failure you have heard that black men don't succeed you have heard that africa is a bad place that's what you have heard that's why you are where you are but some of us heard differently you know what i heard the lord is my shepherd i shall not want he maketh me lie down in green pastures he leadeth me beside the still waters he restored my soul though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death i fear no evil for thou art with me thy rod and thy staff they comfort me thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemy thou anointest my head with oil my cup runneth over yea surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life hear something sir hear something somebody came to me and said kai they were ganging up against you what they said when i heard it i started crying i said i've heard something so they said they said but not with my consent he said every tongue that rises against you in judgment thou shall condemn i've heard something else he said greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world the bible said gather together you will scatter take counsel together you shall come to know speak a word it shall not stand for our god is in our midst i've heard something else there's no enchantment against jacob there's no divination against israel for the sound of a king is in the midst of them i have heard something different that's why we are still standing they say oh all your enemies are around you if their number does not matter he said though the enemy may come in like a flood he said the spirit of the lord shall lift up a standard against them their number does not matter did you not read what the psalmist said god prepares tables for us not where our friends are it's not a birthday party it's a conquest it's a conquest it's dominion he prepares a table for you in the presence of your enemies see this is why what breaks others when it comes to you it charges you up when they tell you people want to kill you ah we don't die we live to fulfill destiny how do we die it's not possible somebody told me the other time he said this is your season he said we don't have season he said surely goodness and mercy shall follow me 
all the days of my life there's no way i would have known that but the world told me that the world told me so i'm not afraid of tomorrow my tomorrow will be better than today because the path of the just man is as a shiny light it shines brighter and brighter unto the perfect day this is why your faith can produce exploit Pray in the Holy Ghost for one minute. Pray in tongue. Chant something. Chant your spirit. Mariga Pakata. Varoda Sazadina. Mantabaro Stava. Makaraba Stavena Talish. Somebody told me, he said, How are we going to succeed? We don't know anybody. I say, I don't need to know anybody. I only need to shine. The Bible says, Gentiles will come to your light. He said, kings, come to the brightness of your rising. I don't need to know anybody. All I need to do is to shine. When I shine, kings will come. When I shine, he's a politician that needs to know men. I am a light. When I shine, everybody I need to know will come. God will link somebody to somebody to tell somebody about me. And connections will be created because my light is shining. If you shine, even kings will come. That's how faith is born. That's how faith is born. They say, oh, how are we going to succeed? This territory is hostile. He said, all that receive the gift of righteousness shall reign in life. We reign. It's not territory that makes us reign. We shine regardless. And the light shineth in the darkness. The darkness comprehended it not. It is when it becomes more hostile that the glory becomes brighter. So nothing can break you. It is from the premise of understanding that you bet exploit. What do you know? Sit, sit down for a moment. Aya, leko paragata. See, your life will not begin and end in Lagos. That's not what was written in the canon. That's not what was written. He said, not many days from now. You shall receive the Holy Ghost and power. Have you received the Holy Ghost? Then your journey begins from Judea to Samaria to the outermost part of the earth. I don't stop in one place. I'm not local. I'm global. I'm global. I'm global. Somebody looked at me and said, Hi, the way you people are spreading is fast. Oh. I said, The hand of God came upon Elijah and he outran the chariots of Ahab unto Jezreel. We speed. It's not our fault. It's the hand of God. It took somebody 30 years. It doesn't mean it has to take me 30 years. Even the king can be overtaken if the hand of God is on your life. He outran. Sometimes when you are reading the word of God, you get drunk. The thing enters you until it starts chucking you. You see your challenge will shrink. That mountain will become a mole, but it will take knowledge. It takes knowledge, knowledge. This is why Isaiah said, Jeremiah said, I found thy world and I did eat them and they became the joy and the joy of my heart. When you know enough, nothing is a challenge. Not the devil, not men, not systems. Because we have everything to destroy them. When devils come against you, he say, having spoiled principalities and powers. He made a public show of them. It's not a private victory. Triumphing over them by the cross. And when he defeated them, he gave you the key. He said, in my name, cast out devils. I don't negotiate with them. I dominate them. Because I'm not the one fighting them. The one who fought them was Jesus on the cross. And so even now when they come to wrestle with me, I put on the armor of salvation. Because in salvation, I am more than a conqueror. There is the head, uh, the, the, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of truth, the, the, the belt of truth, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, the boot of the readiness of the gospel. And I jump up, Satan, where are you? Paka, Suda, Kapata, in the name of Jesus. He knows his place. And then when men gang up, he said, every tongue against you. He said in judgment, he didn't say God will condemn. So when
when they tell me people gang up against me, I say you are in trouble. You have made a mistake. From today, you start wasting your life. Because you are trying to attack a man who is a shining light. It's brighter and brighter. If you don't repent quick, you are in trouble. You are in trouble. But where do you know those things from? Your grandfather can't tell you that. It is only the word of God that can tell you that. And when God is talking, he's not psyching you. He's not to uh, motivate you. The word of God is power. As he's saying it, you are being charged to become everything he says. This is the key to exploit. And trust me, your faith depends on knowledge to produce results. If you don't know your God, you will not be strong. You will not do exploit. I discover exploit has no regard for age. He has no regard for gender. He has no regard for race. Exploit has regard for faith. And your faith must be built on correct understanding. There are three things you need to understand for your faith to work. Please sit down. Number one is who your God is. If you don't know who your God is, when he talks, you will take it for granted. See, man is designed naturally to respond to people based on the height they are talking from. As we are seated here now, if they tell you somebody outside is talking to you, you say, wait, I'm in service. When I finish. If they now tell you the governor of Lagos say he wants to see you, <laughs> all your, it will take honor for God for you to keep calm. The service will become long. Every five minutes will be 50 minutes. You'll be, when are they closing now? What is happening? Because your whole attention is there. Then they now tell you, the president wants to see you. You will whisper to the usher and say, I will watch the recording later. Unless you are a servant of Jesus Christ. If you are not a servant of Jesus, they say the president wants to see you. The first thing you ask is, how? He doesn't know me. They say, no, no, no. This your friend spoke to this person and they say you, you do this, do this, and they say you are the one he wants. Are you sure? I will, I will watch the recording later. You will carry your bag and bend down and walk through the back. You are gone. See, you know what will be happening to you as you are going to the president. You are already calculating that land. I will buy it next week. Nobody spoke about land, but that is your design. Because of the one talking, you know there are many possibilities that accompany his presence. So even the things he has not promised you, you are already planning on it. You say, that man that was talking about that visa, tell him I will see him next week. The visa must be done. Everything will come alive because the president wants to see you. But look at where we are that we don't know. Our God is called Alpha Omega. The beginning and the end. He is the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. Do you know what that means? Omnipotent means he has all power to do all things. Nothing is impossible with him. Omnipresent means he is everywhere at every time in every time. There's a difference between at every time and in every time. At every time means within your present context he is everywhere. But in every time means no time eludes him. That means God is still in yesterday and God is already in tomorrow. That's the one who is promising you something. So he is your tomorrow. He knows your tomorrow. Your tomorrow is in his hands. And he's omniscient. He knows everything that can happen before he says you are blessed. So there is nothing that can defy him. And that's not all. He's the immutable one. He does not change. He will not change. He cannot change. Malachi 3.6, he said, I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore you, the children of Israel, are not consumed. So the omnipotent, the omniscient, omnipresent, and immutable one is the one that says you are blessed. How can somebody tell me you are cursed? He's the one that says you are preserved. How can somebody tell me you will not be preserved? See, that's why the Bible says, let God be true and all men liars. But the reason why you read the Bible is like a history book is because you don't know the one talking. This is why sometimes you need to go to verses of scripture that introduces God in his majesty. 
Jesus was speaking, he said, is there anything too hard for God to do? That is a study in the spirit realm. They are still studying in the spirit realm to find out what God cannot do and no one exists. Is there anything too hard for God to do? The God with whom nothing is too hard to do tells you your future is secure and you have depression. Your depression is a revelation of your ignorance. The revelation of your ignorance. Your God who nothing is too hard for tells you you are protected and preserved and you are afraid. Your fear is not your problem. That fear is an alarm that you are ignorant. This is what the psalmist knew. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I know the Lord. He said, because of that, I shall not want. Psalm 23 verse 1. And he's not just talking. He said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Even in the valley of the shadow of death. He said, I fear no evil. Because thou art with me. He knows the omnipresence. He's everywhere. At every time. In every time. And he said, he prepares a table for me. Not among my friends. In the presence of my enemies. So my enemies can't stop my rising. They will add glory to my testimony. Because a time will come, they will say, Kai, we tried, but truly, God is with this man. Did you read the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They say, oh king, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. He said, we will not bow. Our God is able to save us. And even if he doesn't save us, we will not bow. The king said, you dare me, make the fire seven times hotter. They threw them into the fire, and they were praising God. Guess who saw the fourth man? It was the king. And he said, who is that? That person looks like the son of the highest. It is your enemies that will begin to testify first. I prophesy over someone. Every affliction in your life goes down now. We are not here to psych people. He said, heaven and earth will pass away. Not one jot of my word will pass away. After all, he's the one who sustains all things by the word of his power. You need to know your God. That's why I say they that know their God. They are the ones that will be strong and do exploit. You need to know your God. When you know your God, you become like Mount Zion, like a bloody God. And then when you know your God, you need to know what your God has done for you. Because if you don't know what your God has done for you, you'll be looking for what you already have. And this is the problem with many believers. Know what your God has done and is willing to even do for you. See, every man who made him pack knew these things. Look at what Paul said in Romans chapter 8 verse 32. He said, if God did not withhold his only begotten son, but gave him freely for us, he said, how shall he not with him give us all things? Because Paul knew that Jesus, God gave Jesus, nothing was a prayer point for Paul anymore. He just decreed it. That's why he said in 1 Corinthians 3.21, all things are yours. So a man who knows what God has done for him does not beg, he commands. Because everything God can give, he has already given. And so from the, promise, the premise of that, we become bold to make declaration. He said, ask of me, I will give you the hidden for an inheritance and the uttermost part of the earth for a possession. That's the one we are talking about. He is willing to give you the whole world if you ask him. And he demonstrated that love by giving you all he has, which is his son. What else can he withhold? This is why when you enter a nation, they say nobody succeed here, laugh. Number one, my God can dominate any territory. And number two, there's nothing I ask him that he will not give me. In fact, he is in a business of giving me more than I ask. Jeremiah 33 verse 3, he said, ask of me and we answer. When I'm done answering your small and myopic prayer, he said, then I will show you great and mighty things that you don't know of. So anything you are asking God, God is giving you much more than you are asking. Because he's in the business of giving you beyond what you know and what you can ask. See, this is why we succeed beyond our effort. If you are succeeding at the level of your effort, you are a struggler. We succeed far much more than our effort because our God is giving us more than we are asking. And this is the assurance we now have that we can ask him for anything. You know what I tell God when I want to ask him something? I know that I don't have enough intelligence to ask you enough. So let me begin with this one. 
and most times God does more. My son is two years old. The biggest need he has is a toy. If he's crying, shedding tears, running up and down, what do you want? This toy. That does not distract me for a second. I will blink, they will bring the toy for him. He will be excited. I have my car, I have my house, and God is wondering. You are shouting for house, I'm giving you nations. <laughs> you are shouting over car, I'm giving you the earth as an inheritance. That's what God is doing for us. And this is why we must become bold to take over. See, go beyond your needs. Your needs are too small. He says, seek first the kingdom. Ask for nations. Ask for your generation. See, ask for things that will shake your world. When you go before God, tell him to make you influential so that your generation will see him. That's a good place to start from. When you go before God, tell him to give you the nations so that you can bring his glory and people of all race will come under his government. See, when you ask for such things, money becomes byproduct. Before you invade Europe, you will need a lot of thousands of euros. So euros becomes byproduct. That is why those who know what to ask for, they don't waste their time with little things. When you want to ask God for things, ask him for power that can affect a generation. Power that can affect a generation. When you want to ask God for things, ask him for wisdom that can change the fortune of a territory, a fortune of a nation. Those are the things to ask God for. See, see the people in the world. The Bible said the people of the world are in their generation wiser than the children of the kingdom. They don't ask for petty things. I read about Bill Gates. He was in the university. They were teaching them old programs. He was bored. He said, these people are wasting my time. And he went to start designing a software that will provide the computing need of the whole world. How could he think it? How did he think like that? Mark Zuckerberg was in the university and they were troubled by the myopic things their lecturers were saying. They were looking for what to do to network the whole world. And they came up with Facebook. These people don't have the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Ghost who created the whole world. And you think your need is a car? You think your need is a house? Wake up. You need to know what God has given you. God has given you your generation. God has given you nations. God has given you his son to help your mind to be able to ask for great things. And this is why your life and your faith can produce exploit. And then finally, under the cadre of knowledge, you need to know who you are. If you don't know what God has made you, you will still think you are that nobody looking for somebody to help you. The Bible said in Revelation chapter 1 verse 6, unto him that washed us, and made us kings and priests unto God. You are royal. You are noble. You are not a beggar. You are royal. And the Bible says where the word of the king is, there is power. Who can see unto him what doest thou? You are not ordinary. This is why in the New Testament, they didn't give us a name. They called us new creation. Because God dwells in you, you are carrying the fullness of God on your inside. And you are not just carrying the fullness of God, you are seated with Christ in heavenly places, far above principalities and powers. At that level, they don't beg, they give commandments. At that level, you write laws. And so even when you are praying, pray like a prince. See, Jesus didn't tell us to beg God so that demons are cast out. He said we should cast out devils. Jesus didn't tell us to beg God to heal us. He said we should lay hands on the sick, they will recover. It is teaching you the code of nobility. So that you know who you are. Listen, if you don't know who God has made you, you can't make impact. Everything that is impactful will be a mountain for you. If they tell you Lagos should be taken, you'll start asking, where do we start from? If they tell you God wants to do something in, in, in London, you'll start wondering, who will he send? You are the one. Because you are the one he's depending on now. And the reason he can count on you is because he has put his life on your inside and he has made you a king so you can represent him. Do you know that everything Jesus had was given to us? As you are seated here now, you have the faith of Jesus Christ. Galatians 2.20, you have the faith of the Son of God. As you are seated here now, you have the anointing of Jesus Christ. 
Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, not many days from now, he will anoint you with the Holy Ghost and power. The same anointing Jesus has is the same anointing you have. You have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he made him that was without sin to become sin, that you and I might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You have the same life that Jesus had when he was walking on the earth. The same life that Jesus had that he couldn't be poisoned. The same life that Jesus had that he couldn't be defeated. John chapter 5, verse 11 and 12 and 13. He said, this is the record that God has given us eternal life. And he said, this life is in his son. He said, whoever has the son has life. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So you have the life of Jesus Christ now. How can you be defeated? That means anything that could not happen to Jesus should not happen to you. This is why Jesus said, the works that I do, he said, you shall do also and greater works than this shall you do. Why? Because now he's interceding for you. So you have everything he has and then he's also interceding for you. The same way angels supported Jesus, angels are supporting you. Hebrews 1.14, are they not ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So you have angelic support, you have the life of God, you have the faith of God, you have the anointing of God, and you have the righteousness of God. How can you be defeated? You can't be. You can't. You That has intelligence it will go you have the righteousness of Jesus you should reign in life if something is happening around you that is not consistent with God because righteousness is not just sinlessness though. righteousness is the ability to be right in all things so if anything is happening around you that is not right in the name of Jesus I stop you you will be shocked that that thing has intelligence to obey so it's not happening because you are doing anything first it's happening because of who you are when you talk you talk from the standpoint of God's righteousness you talk from the standpoint of God's anointing you talk from the standpoint of God's life and the power of God will support it but Christians have been brainwashed to see themselves how society see them and so a woman who should be part of Jesus' genealogy would have seen herself as a harlot. Men called Rahab a harlot, but God called Rahab one of Jesus' ancestors. That's the way God sees. And until you begin to see yourself how God sees you, you can never make impact. Impact is a function of specific knowledge. First, the knowledge of God. Second, the knowledge of what God has done for you. And third, the knowledge of who you are in Christ. I know you may be Yoruba and they say you are fearful. That's what they said. That's not what the Bible said. The Bible said you have received the spirit of boldness, of love and of a sound mind. That is my reality. And let God be true. Let all men be liars. This is the foundation of impact. If you don't know this, I can pour a drum of oil on your head. You will walk out of that door and still be defeated. But if you know who you are, even if hands are not laid on you, you will walk out with a new consciousness. Because anywhere I show up, the righteousness of Jesus has shown up. The anointing of Jesus has shown up. The life of Jesus has shown up. The angels that walk with Jesus have shown up. That consciousness will make you dominate your world, even when you don't know. Because the key to this thing is consciousness. Paul said in Colossians 3 verse 1, he said, if you, are, if you say you are risen with Christ, he said, let your affection be on the things above. The moment consciousness is activated, the power is released. And this is the key for exploit. But many don't know. They are still calling themselves what society called them. They are still calling themselves what men called them. I do, don't you know that even your biological parents don't know you well. Only God knows you well. And this is why many people whose parents gave up on them become the answer to their generation. Look at the story of Jabez. A man who was written off became the answer that Israel was looking for. That is the story of somebody hearing me tonight. As you walk out of this place, you will manifest the fullness of God that you represent. You are not ordinary. 
Bible says Christ in you is the hope of glory. God is in you. When you show up, God shows up. In Luke 10, 16, it says when they hear you, they hear me. When you show up, God shows up. You are God's strategy of manifestation. Everywhere God wants to manifest, he sends you there. That is why you are called his witness. You witness, you represent him. And you can't represent him in defeat because he's not a defeated God. This is why you are more than a conqueror. And this is the first faith foundation for exploit. I don't have time. I would have spoken about prayer. That's when we would have charged the beat, we would have ascended. The Bible says, building up yourself upon your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Ha! There is something prayer does to your faith. See, the moment you start praying, it is like what heat does to water. You begin to vaporize. Your dimensions of the, your celestial dimensions start being activated. You will notice that there is a temperature. You know you can drink water and say, mm. go and drink water at 98 degrees and see if you will say, mm. as it's going down your throat, the whole throat will collapse into your stomach. This is how a Christian is. As you are seated here, you are dangerous to the demonic realm. You are volatile. The problem is that you have not introduced heat. Prayer is like refinery. Your faith is there, it's dormant. When you start Paharatoa, Kudu, Atatilia, Vakados, Devek, Berukata, Zuzwa, Papara, Ragadina, a point will come, you will notice that some things will start moving. Melelua, Sisi. You know, the first thing that will happen is that even your voice will begin to change. Yata, Keke, Sahi, Pakatoa. After a while, you that sat down tired, you will notice there is another kind of energy that is different from ATP. This one is the Zoe energy. You who was tired, you will now stand up. Melehus, Tefekes, Bakara, Toale, Bakatina, Bakasta, Brata, Toa, Parata. After a while, hey, your dimensions will start coming one by one. Do you know that the Bible says we have horns? Have you seen it before? No, it's a spiritual reality. It's called authority. He said, my horn has thou exalted like the horn of the unicorn. Do you know we have wings? He said, they that wait upon the Lord, they mount up with wings like eagles. But that wing will not appear until you start waiting. So what prayer does? The unicorn. Not... We have many dimensions, but it will take prayer for those dimensions to ascend. Can I tell you something? How prayer activates your faith for exploit. When you pray to a level, your wings will manifest. You know what the wings does? It gives you speed. So what took somebody else 10 years? You now do it in one month. And they are wondering how the hand of God came upon Elijah. He outran the chariots of Ahab. But you see, those wings will not manifest until you wait upon the Lord. This is why prayer becomes necessary for your faith. As you are praying after a while, you will now discover you will start jumping. And then when they check, you are 70 years old. You know that energy is not physical. You start jumping. When they check, you are on three days fast. Ideally, there's no ATP. But there is Zoe TP. There's divine energy. There's divine energy. And sometimes, when you pray, pray, you discover prophecies will start coming. You start judging. You start judging. You start making declarations. Those things are not written anywhere. They were in your spirit. But it took prayer to excavate them. And then sometimes as you are praying, you now start seeing. You can see your five years from now. Anything that you don't like, you will change it. And anything that you like, you will establish it. This is how we dominate in this world. But you see, it will take prayer for you to go ahead. The word building up yourself is charging up yourself. The way you charge your phone. The phone you are having here has the potential for internet. It has the potential for calls. It has the potential for text message. It has the potential of a touchlight. But if the battery is dead, all of the potential is useless. That's the problem with the believer. He has the faith of the Son of God, but he is not charged. He will take prayer to charge up so that your dimensions begin to manifest. I was praying in a friend's house. And you know the way God is merciful. Sometimes you don't even need to do it for so long. I went to see a friend and I just laid in his pallor and I prayed for like 10 minutes and dozed off. 
suddenly I saw an eagle as big as a building. The eagle opened the wings and it will move into one state. If it opens again, it enters another state. Every time it flaps the wing, it's from state to state. From state to state. And then they zoomed my eyes like a lens. I didn't know those things were possible, but in the spirit realm. And I, I came close to the feather of the eagle and a man was hanging on the wings. And they zoomed further and I saw I was the person. And it was at that point that I woke up from the trance. I didn't know what it meant. One week later, somebody calls me from Ilori. I saw your clip. Can you come and bless us? I said, how did you hear about me? He said, don't worry, somebody shared your clip. Are you serious? Another week, somebody calls me from Ibadan. Can you come and bless us? Another week, somebody calls me from Sokoto. Can you come and bless us? What is going on here? And then before I knew what was happening, the Holy Ghost whispered, gather your clip, put it on Telegram. And I drop it there. In three weeks, I had invitation from 17 nations. You know what happened? As I was praying, I ascended into the spirit realm. So when we move from state to state, it's not politics. It's not human connection. People don't know how to come alive in the spirit. There are many pastors calling people, if you have a conference, I'm available, please invite me. Nobody will remember you. It is when you fly in the spirit that you move from state to state. That's how your business will explode. But the problem is that you are not praying. And you know, if you don't see, you can become. As far as your eyes can see, I have given unto you. Prayer is what we open up your lenses so that you see there. Can we pray in the Holy Ghost for one minute? The faith for exploit is activated by prayer. You are mighty on your throne. You run, you run, you run, you run, Kadosh. You are mighty on your throne. You run, you run, you run. You run, you run, you run. You run, you run, you run. You run, you run, you run, you run. You are mighty on your throne. You run, you run, you run. You run, you run, you run, you run. You are mighty on your throne. You run. Anybody. The only uncle that all of us were trusting him. The moment I graduated, he died. Knew nobody, no help from anywhere. These were the things I built my life on. And by God, we started rising. By God, by God. The other time I was praying, 
and I opened my eyes, light walked out of the wall and entered me. Light. I didn't know light can walk. The wall opened and white light came out and entered me. I stood up from that place. I started talking mysteries as if I was there where the Bible was written. People hear me. People in their 80s, they hear me. They say, how do you know these things? I didn't read them. It came into me by prayer. And some of the things we said traveled to the ends of the earth and men seek us from that far and say, you changed my life. Some of them are three times older than me. How can I change your life? When you are older than me, you should be my grandfather. Light, come. The light is ancient. See, there are many things that can happen to you if you will engage the altar of prayer. It will transform you. You will literally metamorphose. Who told you you are defeated? You are not defeated. You are just not doing what you should do. Your life can change. You may not have anybody. It doesn't matter. If you have people, thank God, maintain that relationship. But in case you don't have anybody, it doesn't matter. God is the one who makes men. And he can make you even tonight. Can you pray for one minute? Father, the grace for exploit. Let it rest upon my life now. The grace for exploit. Let it rest upon my life. I'm tired of being normal. I'm tired of being average. It's time to affect my generation. Father, I make demand of that grace now. Can you pray in the Holy Ghost for one minute? We don't have more time anymore. But be aggressive. The Bible said in the twinkling of an eye, we are changed. It doesn't have to be forever. In a second, in a moment, a change can happen that can affect your lifetime. Pray in the Spirit. Hey, ya, hey, ya, hey. Jesus, please lift your hands toward heaven. When I'm the first speaker in a conference, I don't do so much of power administration. I try to lay foundations because any other person who comes can flow in any dimension. But hear me, there are three things God will do now. Number one, anything dead in your life, it resurrects now. Some of you have lost gifts. Some of you have lost graces. Some of you have lost relationships. Some of you have lost properties. I decree by the power of the Holy Ghost. Everything dead in your life resurrects now. Number two. The Bible said Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit and his fame went abroad there is the a dimension of the hand of god that comes upon a man that translates to instant impact instant he didn't take more than one day he came straight and went to the synagogue he said the spirit of the lord is upon me he has anointed me instantly things began to happen the bible said the land of zebulun the land of naphtali by the way of the sea beyond jordan Galilee of the Gentile, the people that sat in darkness have seen a great light. The hand of God will come upon someone now and there will be instant impact. In the name of Jesus, let the Holy Ghost come upon you afresh. Let the hand of God descend upon you. 
for impact for signs and for wonders in the name of Jesus there's a stirring of the spirit there's a stirring please lift your hand and don't be distracted the Holy Ghost is moving through this congregation now men have been taken from obscurity to stardom men have been taken from depression pain oppression to dominion and power Pacasto, Paragas, Tavana, Sharadiga, Sabak the spirit that lifts man from nothingness to greatness I decree let that dimension rest upon you now And finally, the weight of your ordination is about to be activated. He said, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. And it's on the strength of your ordination that you make him part. He said, I have made you a prophet to the nations. So there is something written about you before you were born. A conference like this, there must be a journey of the spirit to activate that thing. This is why ordinary fishermen became a wonder to their world because what was written about them was not fishers of fish it was fishers of men and when Jesus encountered them he said follow me I will make you fishers of men the sound that awakens ordination in the name of Jesus hear that sound now Circumstance may have made you a beggar. Circumstance may have dislocated you from your calling. But right now I speak by the Holy Ghost. Let the power that causes the lines to fall in pleasant places. Let it awaken your ordination now. Thank you Father. The Lord is telling me now that everything you lack but need for your ordination is being restored for some of you it's your health for some of you it's resources for some of you it's relationships for some of you it's opportunities in the name of Jesus every lack in your life is cancelled now Thank you, Father. Lift your hands and honor him. Everything you need for your ordination is being released. The Lord is touching people now. Please don't be distracted. As much as you can, just focus on Jesus. Somebody by my left here, I think on the fourth or fifth row, by my left here, you have been depressed for some days now and you are just heavy. There's this heaviness as though you are carrying a weight and it's putting a lot of pressure on you. Sometimes you can't even stand up from bed. It's like a weight, a garment of heaviness is on you. The Lord is telling me he's lifting that garment now. Somewhere by my left here, who is that person? Just wave at me here. Mama, you are the one, lift your hand. In the name of Jesus, the power that raised up Jesus from the dead, take it now. That weight is lifted in the name of Jesus. Every form of infirmity that you came here with is leaving your body now. A sick man cannot fulfill destiny. And so I decree and declare every area of your life where you require healing, receive that healing now. Receive that healing now. In the name of Jesus. People with heart conditions are being healed. I'm seeing heart issue, heart palpitation, hole in the heart is being healed. Particularly on my right here, towards the middle of the hall. Somewhere around there, I'm seeing somebody having an excruciating issue. The heart is just jerking. And for some days now, it has been very difficult. Look at where that second AC is, towards that middle row there, by my right. There's a heart condition that God is touching. If you are the one, lift that hand higher. 
Sister, in the name of Jesus, I decree now that affliction is caused to his root. Be healed in the name of Jesus. God is cleansing somebody. I'm seeing others, others being removed and being replaced with fragrances of favor. Body order, mouth order, body order. And it has put reproach on your life. I decree, be healed in the name of Jesus. And the Holy Ghost is telling me now that the grace for fruitfulness, for fruitfulness, both in the spirit and in the natural, I decree and declare, everyone trusting God now for the fruit of the womb by this time next year carry your child and everyone who is barren in your business or in your calling in the name of Jesus be cured of barrenness be fruitful multiply replenish subdue have dominion I curse it I curse it live on now you devil of affliction be healed in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. The garment of reproach is being lifted. The yoke of delay is being lifted. Somebody will receive supernatural speed from this meeting. What you couldn't achieve in 10 years, achieve in one month in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Just lift your hands in one minute and give him glory. The Lord is telling me as we honor him now, a fresh anointing will come upon some of you for lifting, for supernatural. A fresh anointing will come upon some of you for lifting, for supernatural lifting and visibility. Some of you are doing great things, but you are not known. God is bringing light upon you. Light, 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 visibility and multiplication. Visibility and multiplication. Out of them shall proceed the voice of thanksgiving and the sound of them that makes melody. I will multiply them, they shall not be small. I will increase them, they shall not be few. In the name of Jesus, the grace for visibility, the grace for multiplication. In the name of Jesus, carry that grace now. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Give the Lord a big hand. If you were blessed by this message you just listened to and you wish to make Jesus your Lord and personal Savior, kindly repeat the prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your Son, Jesus Christ, and that he died for my sins. He was raised from the dead for my justification. I, therefore, confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord of my life. I receive eternal life into my spirit. I am born again. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. If you just said these prayers, congratulations. You are now a member of the family of God. Kindly send us an email, prayer at encounterjesusministriesinternational.org. You can also visit our website at www.encounterjesusministriesinternational.org.